It is such a joy to be in community this day, Earth Day. Yes, we're going to talk. <laughs> I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit um, this week. Um, usually when I get to do this, which is the thing I l love the most, um, and Reverend Shannon, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I sit down on Monday morning, and I think, okay, God, what are we going to talk about this time? And I kind of go through my notes from Reverend Shannon's talk the week before. I go through whatever is inspiring me at the time. I look at the calendar. I see what's coming up. So Monday morning, I sit down. Okay, we have Earth Day. Okay, important. We have Passover. Very important. We have a beautiful Passover dinner coming this week that you're going to hear more about. And I sat and I meditated and um, nothing. And I thought, that's okay, it's Monday. Sat down Tuesday morning. Same process, same result. I thought, that's okay, it's only Tuesday. I'll put that away. I'll prep for a class that practitioner Terry and I are teaching. Let, let's, let's, let's just move on. It'll come in God's time. It didn't. I have nothing. I have nothing for you today. <laughs> and finally, yesterday, I sat down with spirit and I had a good heart to heart. And I said, look, <laughs> this is not going to work for Reverend Shannon and I'm not going to get to do this anymore. <laughs> and I was inspired in that moment to go deeper and to ask myself, why? Why am I having a block around something that I love fiercely, which is Earth Day? Um, when I was 18, 17, 16 years old, lo these many years ago, um, I started the first um, environmental club at my high school in Atlanta, Georgia. I care deeply about this. I have been a member of Greenpeace since I was 16 years old. This is something I care profoundly about that I have lent my time and my resources to. And it comes back again. And I feel sad. I feel sad, I feel like um, it's not enough, I can't do enough, um, we can't do enough. Blech. Do you ever feel like that? Um, I found myself, when, when, I, when I get to the bottom of something and I realize I'm having an experience like that, I like to kind of look back for patterns. When else have I felt about the state of the world? Oh, a lot. Like, it's been a lot, Reverend Shannon, um, since well before COVID. And we've been, um, we've been coping, and we've been um, growing, and we've been learning, and we've had lots to celebrate as well. But when you're 51 years old and you're watching the rights that you took for granted get stripped away, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And so I sat yesterday morning in my exhaustion and I sat and I invited spirit in because that's what I do. That's what we do. We partner with something greater than ourselves. And when, you, when I had that experience of inviting spirit in, um, I got a nudge. Reverend Shannon has taught us about divine nudges. I got a nudge and a remembering that right about this time last year, I gave another talk about Earth Day. And I went back and I looked at that talk and I realized that um, I had read an article from the Greater Good Science out of UC Berkeley where they said the best thing that we can do to help the, client, the climate is to maintain hope. 
that hope is the most important thing to empower us to change. We have to have hope to change. And I thought, hot diggity, that's it. I've got it. This is what, this is what I need to talk about. So I went back and I, visit, I revisited that article, and this really stood out to me. The, she said, if you lose hope, she quoted Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and, and she said this, uh, if you lose hope, he said, somehow you lose the vitality that keeps moving. You lose that courage to be, that quality that helps you go on in spite of yourself. According to Martin Luther King in his Christmas message in 1967, hope gives us courage to move on. And of course, he was talking about the civil rights movement, which is also brings me despair. But his words apply to all of our social justice work, all of it. Hope is the most important thing to bring courage to our action. So, instead of writing a talk today, I'm bringing you four things that came to me this week that brought me hope. And I'm gonna gift them to you to do with as you will. Before I, um, before I do that, I just want to say that um, despair isn't just about our social justice work. You know, despair is such a um, beautifully human place to be. And it, if you find yourself in despair about anything, about a relationship, about a, a situation in your finances, about the way we keep treating our, our beautiful Mother Earth as if she doesn't exist. If you're in despair about anything in your life, I think it's important to recognize that despair is the, uh, it comes from, I love this, it comes from the Latin day, which is from, and spes or sperare, which is hope. So despair is the absence of hope. Yeah, um, there was a Roman goddess of hope. I didn't know this. Her name was Spes, Spes, the Roman go goddess of hope. I looked up hope on Wikipedia, and it turns out that hope is one of the three theological virtues of the Christian tradition. And um, it's said in Wikipedia, while faith is a function of the intellect, hope is an act of will. Hope is an act of will. Hope is something that takes our brain and our heart and makes them work together. But it takes a spark, I have found for myself. Hope takes a spark. So here's some sparks. Here's some things that brought me hope this week. The first one came actually from Reverend Shannon's mom. Hi, Peg. <laughs> when you posted this letter from E.B. White this week, I thought, that's inspiring and it brings me hope. So I'm gonna share this with you. In 1973, the year I was born, E.B. White wrote the following reply to a Mr. Nato, who quote, sought White's opinion on what he saw as a bleak future for the human race. And he wanted to know what E.B. White, of course, E.B. White is the beloved American author of Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little. Um, Something else I can't think of right now. So E.B. White said, Dear Mr. Nato, as long as there is one upright man, as long as there is one compassionate woman, the contagion may spread and the scene is not desolate. Hope is the thing that is left to us in a bad time. I shall get up Sunday morning and wind the clock as a contribution to order and steadfastness. Sailors have an expression about the weather. They say the weather is a great bluffer. I guess the same is true of our human society. Things can look dark, then a break shows in the clouds and all is changed, sometimes rather suddenly. 
It is quite obvious that the human race has made a queer mess of life on this planet. Isn't it though? Isn't it though? But as a people, we probably harbor seeds of goodness that have lain for a long time waiting to sprout when the conditions are right. Humans' curiosity, relentlessness, inventiveness, and ingenuity have led them into deep trouble. We can only hope that these same traits will enable them to claw their way out. He said, hang on to your hat. Hang on to your hope and wind the clock, for tomorrow is another day. Hang on to your hat, hang on to your hope and wind the clock. Last week, Reverend Shannon was uh, teaching us about leaps of faith and how some of them are these big leaps of faith and some of them are small acts of courage. Sometimes just winding the clock is what we can do, but that act of winding the clock says there will be a tomorrow and I'm bringing order to my life in this moment. So if all you can do is that one small act, do it, do it. Because when we all do the one small act, well, seven billion small acts add up really fast. They really do. So take the leap of faith. That was the first thing, the letter from E.B. White. Thank you, Peg, for that gift today. The second thing, this came across my desk this morning. This morning. Um, And a fellow uh, minister in our movement found this and posted it this morning in honor of Earth Day. Listen to this story. According to an old Native American legend, one day there was a big fire in the forest. All the animals fled in terror in all directions because it was a very violent fire. Suddenly, the jaguar saw a hummingbird pass over his head, but in the opposite direction. The hummingbird was flying towards the fire. Whatever happened, he wouldn't stop. But moments later, the jaguar going this direction, saw him pass again, this time in the same direction as the jaguar was walking. So the jaguar observed this coming and going until he decided to ask the bird about it because it seemed like very bizarre behavior. What are you doing, hummingbird, he said. I am going to the lake, she answered. I drink water with my beak, and I throw it on the fire to extinguish it. The jaguar laughed. Are you crazy? Do you really think that you can put out that big fire on your own? No, said the hummingbird. I know I can't, but the forest is my home. It feeds me. It shelters me and my family. I am very grateful for that. And I help the forest by pollinating its flowers. I am part of her, and she is part of me. I know I can't put out the fire, but I must do my part. At that moment, the forest spirits who listened to the hummingbird were moved by the bird and its devotion to the forest. Miraculously, they sent a torrential downpour which put an end to the great fire. It's said the Native American grandmothers would occasionally tell this story to their grandchildren and then conclude with this. Do you want to attract miracles in your life? Do your part. You have no responsibility to save the world or find the solutions to all problems, but your responsibility is to attend to your particular personal corner of the universe. As each person does that, the world saves itself. Our job is to attend to our particular corner. One person can't do it all, but one person can do all that they can do. And this certainly applies to climate justice. This certainly applies to social justice. This also applies to our family dynamics, parents, 
grandparents, children of aging parents. We're never going to be able to fix it all because we're not here to fix it. We're here to love it, and we're here to do what is clearly ours to do. And sometimes that's easier than others. But what I loved about this story, the thing that brought me hope was this line when it said, I know I can't put out the fire, but I must do my part. Could you see that little green hummingbird flitting back and forth, doing its little part? From now on, I'm going to see myself as a little hummingbird. I'm just going to do my part. And I'm going to trust that there is an energy and a love and a spirit that is greater than me that is going to send the torrential downpours to do its work, right? Sometimes we mix up what is our work and what is God's work. It's important that we feed hope so that we have the courage to carry the water. The third thing that came to me to inspire me this week, um, and this is a quote I have seen many times before, but I adore this woman. I just want to read you a quote from Wangari uh, Maathai, who was the Green Belt Movement founder and the first African woman Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, If you don't know who she is, come to know her work. It's beautiful, beautiful work. And she said this, In the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground, A time when we have to shed our fear and give hope to each other. And that time is now. That time is now. Isn't she beautiful? First African woman to win the Nobel Prize. And she says, it's time now for us to feed these seeds of hope to each other. So I'm wondering, what can we do as a spiritual community, what can we do as individuals to feed the hope, to feed the good? One thing that we've talked about before is looking for the good in the world and magnifying that, right? It's so important that we do that because if we don't, we end up doing what we call praying the problem. And we can sometimes focus on the problem so much that we forget to find a solution. But in my studies this week, I had lots of time to study since I wasn't writing a talk. (laughs) So I want to share with you something I learned about Passover this week. Um, For um, those who might be new to this concept, I'm going to give you the Shelley Walker two-minute version of Passover, and we will have no theological police (laughs) coming to get me because it is way too big for me to really um, uh, uh, wrap it in a pretty bow for you this week. So I'm going to give you my new thought version of Passover. I want you to know that later this week you can have a much more authentic Passover experience, Jewish Passover experience with our beloved Joan. Um, so, but I want, to, I want to tell you something that I learned that really inspired me. Um, Passover, uh, it comes from uh, when Moses, Moses, no, it, it, of course it wasn't Moses. <laughs> You remember Pharaoh and the plagues? Do you remember the frogs and the locusts and the bleeding and the blood and the, and the sick people? And the, this was another effort of the Jewish people to be free of enslavement. There are so many um, stories in the Old Testament and the entire New Testament is about a search for freedom and redemption. So, um, in an effort to free 
um, the, the Israelites, they, God sent, God said, you know, free them or there's going to be trouble. And they didn't free them, so there was trouble. The last of the plagues, this is the one I want to talk about. The last of the plagues um, said, um, so we're just going to take all the firstborn children. And um, if we'll know that you're righteous and holy, if you sacrifice a lamb and put the blood on the door, and that's how we'll know not to take your child. And the angel of death came and went door to door and took all the children. So let me tell you, six-year-old Shelly sitting in Southern Baptist Church was terrified <laughs> by this story. I want you to know. Um, and... It's interesting to look back and to see not only how it was taught to me, but how I understood it in my own immaturity, right? Because when you actually look at it from a consciousness teaching, it looks like this. If we don't die to our old way of being by choice, we're going to do it not by choice. The reason that Passover is about putting the blood on the door is because we, it's our duty to show our true selves, blood, to the world. And when we show our true selves, when we can tr show our inner nature to the world and live that and be that, we die to an old way of being. Now, what does that have to do with hope, you might be asking. Shelley doesn't usually get gruesome on Sunday mornings, in case you're wondering. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Part of why I find myself in despair sometimes is because what I'm doing, what we're doing, what we're doing isn't working. And we can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. And I find the spinning of the wheels to be exhausting. It's tiring. But this idea that when I can show my true nature, I can be saved, but not in a rescuey way, in a healthy, whole, loving way. It's inspiring to me because it's time for us to lay down the things that no longer work. It's time for us to lay down the armor. It's time for us to lay down the masks that we wear to get along. They serve no one. Now, some of us learned how to put on this armor and to don these masks because we needed that to be safe in the world. If you still need that to be safe in the world, God bless you. Do what you need to do to really be safe. But it's important that we ask ourselves, is it serving me? Is it still serving me? Or is it time to put away the childish understandings and the old ways of being so that we can be our true selves, so that we can do new and different things? things. It's time. It is time. So the invitation becomes to ask yourself, what can I do to be a hope bringer? To find that authentic hope, to find that authentic love in myself, and to turn it inside out and to show it to the world. What can I do to be a hope bringer? The fourth thing and final thing I found to share with you that brought me hope this week. According to an article from Harvard Health, I read this. Hope is an essential component of our well-being. Hope is important for our physical health. What can we do when it seems to be in short supply? First, we can start by practicing gratitude. 
spending a few minutes each day recounting the positives in one's life, even the small ones, like noticing a moment of serenity in the sunshine or the endorphins of a brisk walk around your neighborhood. These things can have an enormous impact. So number one is gratitude. Next, we can begin to actively envision realistic ways that our circumstances can improve. Pain and discomfort often subside. Even deep sorrows can pass with time. In all these cases, the action to embrace is to choose to be mindful and deliberate about fostering positivity even in the face of his absence. That's from Harvard Health. Hope is important mentally. Hope is important spiritually. Hope is important physically. So according to Harvard, the ways that we foster health are number one, hope, gratitude. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Number two, envision realistic ways our situation can improve. There's a difference between magical thinking and realistic envisioning. And it is important to understand that difference. Magical thinking says... I can continue to do the same things and somebody will make it better. That's magical thinking. Realistic envisioning says I can deepen my commitment to um, using my voice for change in the world. I can commit to writing uh, or calling my senator once a month. That's a realistic change that I can envision having an impact on the world. But that's not just true of climate change. That's true of everything in our lives. It's time to put away magical thinking and from the power and the love and the, and the God within you, envision something greater and know that it, can, it too can be real when we put our feet to it, when we take the action. And we take the action. So number one, gratitude. Number two, envisioning realistic ways that our circumstances can improve. And I'm just going to add a third, just to circle back to the beginning, and that is to lean into faith. To lean into faith. Understanding that a God of love is with us and for us and that, as Butterworth said, you are God's living enterprise and God cannot fail Right? We lean into that, and in that hope, something begins to open in our minds and in our hearts and in our lives. And the tiniest leap of faith, the tiniest act of courage, and we step through into a new way of being, a new way of loving. 